We here at Urban Rider like to think of ourselves as optimists, which is why we recently made a video on how to stay cool on your motorcycle. Forgetting, of course, that we live in the UK, and as the comments quite rightly pointed out, we didn't get a summer. So we've learned from our mistakes, we've put all optimism aside. This is how to stay dry. Of course, true to form, we start talking about how to stay dry and it offers us one of the driest days I've seen in weeks. But have no fear, if there's one thing you can be properly confident of in the UK, it's that it will rain at some point, so these tips will be useful. We're going to start head to toe. First consideration for a watertight helmet, obviously, is going to be having the option to close vents if you have vents, and it is always preferable to have vents on your helmet. Next up, you'd want to inspect your visor seal. You would like, ideally, to have a tight seal between the visor and the helmet itself. The other crucial element is going to be anti-fog of some sort. The best version of which, which we've still found today, is to go for pin lock in some capacity. And most helmets will have the capacity to fit pin lock to their visors. Any that don't will probably say they have an anti-fog and anti-scratch coating, which varies. Some of them are better than others. We tested the John Doe 1, for example, quite recently. The anti-fog on that actually is quite good, but personally, I still prefer pin lock where I can get it. Now, if you are looking for a little bit of extra support for your visor, then we recently received this. It's called Visio Dry, and it is a hydrophobic coating that you can apply to your visor, your clocks, your mirrors, whatever you choose, and it will literally repel water. And it is quite effective, and it did actually impress me when I used it. But a few things to note. Firstly, it does leave a barely visible layer on your visor. It definitely won't obscure your vision, but you can see it from the outside. And the other thing is it will need periodically reapplying. Obviously that varies depending on your usage, but in my personal opinion, I would prefer it lasted a little bit longer. With most jackets that include some form of waterproofing, there are going to be two main methods. They use either a drop liner or a laminated liner. I will explore drop liners first because that is the most common. A drop liner is essentially an additional layer. It is separate from the outer layer. It can also be removable, which can be a useful thing. Generally speaking, drop liners are cheaper to produce, more comfortable or flexible, I should say, often removable and more breathable. And if they're not more breathable in practice, the fact that they are removable will back up the breathability in as much as you can actually take it out. And most of these jackets would also have some form of venting on them. And obviously the airflow is gonna get in a lot better when it's not raining, which does happen occasionally, when you don't have a liner included. So being able to remove it can be handy. That brings me on to an interesting point. How waterproof do you actually want to be? And I'll pause for a response. Silly question, fully waterproof, of course. Well, it might not actually be that silly a question because waterproofing, bear in mind, is always in conflict with breathability. It's a delicate balance between how waterproof you want to be and how breathable you can make an item. Now, for reference, waterproofing is measured using a hydrostatic head test which basically measures the amount of water pressure an item can withstand. And to make things even more confusing, they measure that in millimeters, referring to the abstract idea of a column of water, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 millimeters tall. The higher the number, effectively, the more waterproof the item is. Now, I've heard this number fluctuate, but most manufacturers will agree something above 10,000 millimeters is considered fully waterproof. Breathability is measured in grams of water vapor that can pass from inside to outside within a 24 hour period. And that's great in theory, but if it's actually raining outside, then you can ignore that for the most part. Because if there is a layer of water on the outside of your waterproof jacket, then it effectively makes a bit of a barrier that your sweat cannot permeate and escape. To help with this, most jackets out there will come with some form of hydrophobic treatment. There we reference that again. So basically that enables the water to bead up and roll off and not sit on the outer fabric. Think of waxes, think of oils, think of DWR treatments, something like that. And it's also the reason why you should periodically reapply these treatments to your jackets. Not that anyone ever does. But either way, it's still not perfect when it comes to maximizing your breathability. So I'll come back to my original question. How waterproof do you want or need to be? If you're just doing a short trip, so you're worried about getting caught in a light shower, then water resistant might actually be enough for you. 
For anyone else who wants to be fully waterproof, including myself, let's continue. The less common option is to go for a laminated layer, which manufacturers don't often include unless it's on their flagship or more expensive items because it is more costly to produce. You're basically bonding that waterproof layer to the outer layer. That will definitely enable it to be a little bit thinner in practice. They can also be a little bit stiffer though, so bear that in mind. The big strength though is that because it is bonded to the outer fabric, it means the outer fabric is fully waterproof. So rather than allowing the outer fabric occasionally, if it's really heavy rain, to wet out, it will be fully waterproof. That will mean that it is lighter, it will dry faster, and it can be a little bit warmer. And what I mean by that is if your outer fabric wets out, obviously, cold, wet jacket on top of a waterproof liner is going to chill you out whilst you're riding. So if you're doing a long trip, if you're doing a lot of riding and you know that's just going to seep into your bones and make you cold, you might want to go for a laminated option. Another name you've surely come across with waterproofing is Gore-Tex and it can be quite a divisive point and I'm not going to wade in on this argument. There are videos online if you want to do your own research as to the effectiveness of Gore-Tex and whether or not it justifies the price. In my humble opinion, having used lots of waterproof membranes and liners over the years, I don't think it's always necessary to go for Gore-Tex. I'm perfectly happy to go for a waterproof membrane by the manufacturer. A lot of them make some very good in-house waterproof membranes. To be honest with you, and I'm sure if you've been riding for some time, you will have found this yourself. Doesn't matter what kind of reliability or assurance a brand gives you on their waterproofing, even Gore-Tex will say there is a realistic expectation as to the lifespan of their waterproof membrane, meaning that at some point in the future, they do expect it to fail which is when you might want to consider the other option. The other option then, and my preferred choice, is to go for a waterproof outer layer that you can stick over the top of your clothing. It is more versatile. Now we have a company favorite, and when I say company favorite, what I mean by that is the amount of people in our company that have these is quite impressive. It speaks for itself, really. Uh, now, I will tell you they are slightly higher on the spectrum when it comes to cost. So you can definitely find things cheaper and you might want to go for that. But there are a few key things that they do so well, which you'll want to look out for in the waterproof layer that you're considering. They pack down nice and tight. And that's where they're quite useful to bring with you because they're so easy to load in. If you're going out and the weather is changeable, which you can expect in the UK, then obviously you can put these on when you need them and pack them away when you don't. Now, what I will say, where I kind of made a mistake and one of my colleagues uh, made a better choice, is they do them in different colors. Now, I went with the exact same color for the trouser as the jacket. And that means that one time I went out and um, I thought I'd taken the trousers with me and it was the jacket. And as hard as I tried to get my legs into the sleeves, it just wasn't gonna happen. So I had to get home soaking wet. So if you can, I would recommend going for a different color in the jacket than the trousers so you can identify which is which. I'm gonna illustrate my point now and say that I actually, honest to God, don't know which one this is, jacket or trousers. Well, 50-50, what do you reckon? Jacket, trousers? Go with jacket. Come with jacket. All right, we have trousers. You'd be cold on your torso. <laughs> so now if I was gonna pick one over the other and you just wanna go for either jacket or trousers, I would say for me, I would prioritize the trousers because fully waterproof trousers are definitely not as comfortable as the likes of motorcycle jeans where you can obviously stick this over the top. So I personally will always go for waterproof trousers. The jacket is something that if it's raining really heavy, then I might stick that over the top of this. Or if it's really cold, actually, like I say, they're a good windbreak as well. You can stick that over the top. Now, what you'll want to look out for with your waterproof layers is that they have taped seams. That's the same with any waterproof layer, jacket or trousers. With the Ergo Pro, they're actually bonded seams as well. So it's a bit of a belt and braces measure where they put the tape over in key areas, but it's not throughout the whole item. So these are bonded here, meaning that the water isn't gonna find a way in. Something else you want to make sure of is that they're easily accessible to the bottom. These obviously have zips, so you can open them wide, stick them over the top of your boots and then fasten them and they're elasticated around the ankles as well. So it's definitely not going to allow water obviously up the trouser leg and make your feet wet, get into your boots, anything of that sort. And the really big USP to the Ergo Pro, in my opinion, is how flexible they are as a fabric. And it also means it's just more comfortable to wear because it has a bit more give in it. The flexibility just means that you're more comfortable on the bike and hopefully means that there's slightly less pressure on certain areas. I'm going to ask Will where your waterproof trousers tend to fail. 
Yeah, <laughs> for those that didn't hear, crotch, just in case. On any waterproof trousers I've ever had in the past, if they're gonna fail, it's gonna be around the crotch. So I want special care and attention given to my crotch and the seat of my pants. Uh, so with these ones, because they've got a bit of extra flexibility in them, it's not got the same sort of tension applied to the seams in that area. Generally speaking, if you're on the bike, that's where the water's gonna run down the tank and pool and sit there for longer as well. So it needs to be extra specially waterproof. A pretty obvious point is gonna be to pay attention to your gaps, to so seal everything off, like your neckline, your sleeves, although I'll get onto gloves in a few moments, and pay attention to your zips as well. Waterproof zips are pretty easy to spot, but some are better than others. At the very least, what you want is a channel on the front or a flap on the front to close across the zip, much like a gutter. It's gonna direct that water away, down and out. When it comes to my hands, my general principle is that any waterproof membrane will do. I mentioned before about Gore-Tex. I don't really care whether it's got that name attached to it. I don't often have a problem when it comes to my gloves failing for waterproofing. So with these, for example, they are the Revit Boxer 2, and they've got a Hydrotex Z liner, and they are working absolutely fine. I wear them on the bike often. I've even taken them snowboarding, and they were really good choice, actually. Top tip if you're ever you know, skiing or snowboarding is that sometimes you can use a lot of your motorcycle gear, and it comes in handy. Now, with these, what I would like to say is it's good to go for a glove that's slightly on the larger side, because if you get wet hands, trying to force your hand back in can be a pain in the bum and make a consideration as to the liner or the comfort liner the glove has as well in that case because you want to make sure it's really easy to get your hand back in if you've got damp hands from taking off bike locks or something like that. Now what I really like about the Revit boxes and I have to say actually shout out to Revit their waterproof gloves are some of my favorites another one will be Knox genuinely they make some really good options and actually Knox have better armor and protection in my opinion uh, and if you really want something to just blast the winter then Knox could be a really good choice there now with these ones what I particularly like is that they have a elasticated cuff which means they're tight around your wrist and you can fit them underneath your sleeves now that's just what I prefer, and often that's when I'm doing shorter trips. Although, to be fair, I'll wear these on longer trips as well, higher speed stuff. What I will say, though, and you're right to say it, I'm sure the comments are coming, that you want the gauntlet to go over your sleeve because, of course, that's the way the rain is going to go. If you're riding into the rain, then it's going to hit and obviously go up. Um, some of my colleagues do also offer the counterpoint though that it hits the sleeve and then tracks back down to the glove. Either way, it's not often that I find that it fails or it finds a way back to my palm. Not much of an issue. With these ones though, what I particularly like is just that they are a lot easier to fit with your jacket than a big fat cuff which often just sort of gets stuck and you feel all sort of puffed up and awkward. So I prefer these where I can get them and Revit are one of the brands that do these most often. If you were to ask me what I've had the most problem with in the past when it comes to waterproofing and what has failed on me in other items, it would be the waterproofing in my boots. Now I've had boots that I've spent less money on and they've been more reliable when it comes to waterproofing and I've spent lots on my boots in the past and had that waterproofing fail quicker. Although we don't get to product test things over an extended period of time, other than the gear we actually buy ourselves, we only get hands on them for maybe a couple of weeks, which isn't really long enough to tell you whether or not exhaustively that waterproof membrane is going to be reliable. And it is on a case by case basis as well. I might find that it works really well for me, but you might find that it fails quicker. So my advice would be obviously if it fails within the warranty, then just return it. Make sure you get a watertight pair of boots. Don't accept it leaking on you. The big things I tend to look for with my waterproof boots, in fact the biggest, is the fact that it is a tall pair of boots. I like my boots to come higher than your shin. The taller the better and I want to make sure that waterproof membrane goes the full way up as well. Often what that means is a side zip entry which also makes them a lot easier to get in or out of. One of the pairs of boots that we really like and when I say we I mean me and Will and a lot of the rest of our team actually are the TCX Drifters. They've been around for a long while. He's currently wearing them and I think he could testify that these are reliable and comfortable and he really likes them don't you Will? <laughs> Now, before Will and I get soaked, because the weather is once again changing, it's getting quite dark, uh, and the camera is not that waterproof. We're talking about electronics and luggage. Now, one of the things that absolutely gives me the fear, and I've had problems in the past, in fact, actually, 
uh, is my luggage, my backpacks, that sort of thing. So I found a reliable option that I am happy with. This is a combination between Revit and Krieger. We have a waterproof pouch on the front, but this pocket is not waterproof. That's where I fell foul in the past. You can say I have my laptop in there once again, but what I learned from that occasion is that I always carry a waterproof laptop pouch in addition that I can stick the laptop in. Now, if I didn't have that, this bag does have a waterproof pouch on the front, so I would basically just swap over my items. Recently, we've reviewed some from Knox. Now, I do like their backpacks. Personally, I prefer Krieger, I think, uh, but when it comes to Knox things, we've got the EDA, or Everyday Adventure, and the new Studio, both of which have waterproofing. So the Studio is fully waterproof, and the Everyday Adventure has a waterproof cover. Now, if you don't want to wear it on your person, you could also go for some luggage options, panniers or a tail pack or a tank bag, that sort of thing. And we have a few different options, loads and loads, which you can go through. And obviously just double check they're fully waterproof. I personally really like SW Motec and their Legend gear. I have personally used that in the past. Again, it's a removable waterproof liner, which you can put in there and a roll top and you can just clip them in. We've also got loads of stuff from Enduristan, which again is fully waterproof and it has some really tough zips, really waterproof zips that you actually need lubricant for. Uh, you know it's a waterproof zip when you have to lubricate it as a result of how tight it is. But have a little look at the options we've got available. IP ratings are what you'll want to pay attention to with your electrical devices if you're planning to use them when you're on the bike. Things like your phone, a comms unit, or navigation. Now, IP stands for ingress protection. The first number goes from one to six and describes how capable your device is at withstanding dust and sand. The second number goes from one to eight and refers to its resistance to water. I think it's fresh water, not salt water, although my phone, I've taken it in the sea and it still works absolutely fine. I know it's not recommended, but it does still work. So this is actually rated at IP68. Most of the stuff on my bike is rated at IP67, which is what I wanna aim for with my waterproof items. I think I've seen as low as IP66 used for certain items, but I would personally prefer to have it IP67 and higher. Now, if you've got any of your own tips, drop them in the comment section down below. You can find links to any of the things that I mentioned in the description, and we will keep that up to date in the future. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you soon.